Sure. So, um, tonight's work session is um, the main item for the work session is reviewing a proposed um, review process for capital improvement projects or public improvement projects that the town has. I know there's been some discussion in the past on on uh, some confusion about how, when a project gets approved and when it doesn't, and what staff determines uh, is an approved project or right. our ability to move forward and what some of the board members think is, is uh, a point where it's either approved or we've got the okay to move forward with the design work and, and fitting it out. And so, um, Trustee Skumatz and I think with some input from some of the other board members, Trustee Pennington, came up with a, uh, a draft uh, spreadsheet to assist in um, tracking a public project as it moves through the process and to trying to determine who, what advisory committees the project might go to, when it goes to the Planning Commission, if at all, when it goes to the Town Board. Um, and I don't know, Trustee Skumatz, if you want to kind of take us through your spreadsheet or how you want to... Well, thanks. You um, I think the, the um, key was that, yes, it tracks, but it also plans. So it also comes up with what is the, what is the set of steps that, we, that the board thinks is appropriate for that particular undertaking, project, whatever you want to call it. And um, I think... So okay. it's, it's trying to figure out, given the complexity or whatever, and how many or who's affected or whatever, um, we would come up with a clear plan at the beginning of what steps we think the project ought to go through so that everybody knows with great advance warning when something's going to be seen by them and by whom and, and, and all that. So is it going to go to an advisory committee or not? Is it going to go to the planning commission or not? Is it, you know, does it reach that level or not? How many... Hearings are there about it, that sort of thing, and that's something that would be uh, established up front with some clear steps and their associated deadlines, and we would be able to then know what's happening and sort of when we've quote approved a project. And so this this wouldn't include private development. That's or covered those type of projects because those are all covered under Chapter 16, so we don't have to worry about those. It's just more of the public improvement projects. The other question is, I think at the beginning that we need to decide is, is it going to include maintenance or is it just new projects, new parks, new road projects, or what it's going to include? Uh, I think your maintenance projects staff would recommend that doesn't include those because you're talking about your street overlays. Um, is there I already like a process that. for those that we that, that exists? I mean, the the I'm just and I'm, that's mm -hmm. a just a totally naive question. I mean, so the question that in those cases, staff has put into the budget some dollar amount for overlay of streets, mm -hmm. and I think the normal process is they either they go out for bid and then we see that at bid time and at that point. When do we see any plans, or do we not see plans? You wouldn't see plans on that example. Um, you would, it would come to the board at the time we'd bid it out, come to the board at the time we're ready to approve the contract. So in that case, let's say, oh, so let's, let's look at the ever, you know, ever popular, um, uh, project over here, um, mm -hmm. the, you know, making it a boulevard -y and changing the things like that. So in that case, we, I know that's not standard, you know, like street yeah. improvements, but it's a, it's a street improvement project. Right. In that case, I think we did want to see plans and well, have public input on those plans and all that sort of thing. So how do we distinguish? Well, I think we're already there because in the capital improvement budget, we list items under maintenance or new. Thank you. So I mean that would be a new. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So as you Just as the board get goes, my brain. yeah, yeah. As the, as you <laughs> go through the process for developing the 2012 budget, say, I think it'd be important 
if the board thinks no, this isn't maintenance, mm -hmm. okay. that you'd speak up and, and let okay. staff know that so we can. I'm not trying to put it off more than we should chew. Yeah. I mean, that's not that's not my plan. Just right. trying to understand how it works. And some some things. Uh, what comes to mind actually is the annual flower planting, which has been a bit contentious for the past couple of years, um, where we take an existing project that mm -hmm. sort of maintenance, in which we want it restructured, want the process restructured, where we want bids in it, you know, we want to conceptualize and con conceive of it differently this year with uh, the possibility of more zero escape being built in, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, to me, spans, it, that could possibly be a project in which we want to make a project of it while it is an, uh, an existing sort of maintenance project. So that's one of those where you want to move it from maintenance to, to yeah. more so my attitude is we need to just grow with this. We try, we try it, we revise it, we uh, as we get more comfortable with it and we see its application, then we apply it more broadly. But we've got to start somewhere. Let's start up some logical steps and then grow it. Like what's in the budget for this year that's new and how does it work? How many projects should be going at one time, new and maintenance projects? Well, we have, a, uh, there's the maintenance projects far exceed the new projects. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I don't, I mean, I don't have a number for you um, on what the ratio is from new to maintenance, but uh, there's considerably more maintenance projects that have timing issues involved with them as right. well, like the street maintenance. You know, we, we want to make sure we get that bit out in time to where <coughs> we can make sure the project, you know, is done before school starts or, or whatever we may need. So. so you get together with your team and you, every project that's in there, maintenance or new, you're meeting with your team and you're going through some timeline, right? Yeah, and I'll show you here. Um, so this is what we use. Um, we do one of these every year and we have each department come up with, um, uh, so here's public works. And this is for this year. Um, they, they list the project, and we have the budget, and then um, when the design is going to be, when the bid opening, when the bid amount, and um, the department <laughs> has put, put together this for the manager every year after the budget's been approved. And those are new projects or those are maintenance? These are um, mainly... Uh, this looks like it says it CIP is, implementation. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, because I'm, I don't see things in there like um, when does it go to the board or when does it have a public hearing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not as detailed as that. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of a general um, schedule. It doesn't include the details. Mm -hmm. of, it goes to this committee. It goes to the planning commission. It goes to the town board. But you could add columns could to add that columns effect. To it, yeah. Um, so, uh, and then Parks does theirs, um, and then, you know, administration, we don't have many projects, but. So that's something we use. Um, I think it'll also be important for staff as we go through is um, just to make it easier for us. We're not changing the process every time for every project. I mean, it'd be helpful for us mm -hmm. um, as far as planning out our projects for the entire year that we mm -hmm. know the process right. in I advance. Think, I think, you know, early on we may have some variations, but I think it's going to come pretty soon where we'll have either the more complex steps or the simple steps, you know, that I, I suspect that's going to happen, but I don't, I don't know that I'm there yet. I don't know that I know that yet, mm -hmm. what that would be. So, Matt, in, you're, um, you've played around a little bit with this one, and, and you certainly know this one well, how well do you see them sinking? I mean, do you feel like you can ad adapt yours to be a little more specific? Um, Definitely. So that it accomplishes this? Yeah, I mean, we can use either one. We might have to modify the one that um, Trustee Skumas came up with just to make the formulas work with our schedule and stuff, but we could use that one or we could modify this one and include more detail in it if the board wanted. Um, well, I don't think we were wedded to that particular form, but we were wedded to 
making sure that we knew that the steps were going in the right order mm -hmm. and that we didn't skip steps. We didn't end up doing something, you know, applying for a grant before we approved a project, that sort of thing. Can't, you know, we can't be doing that kind of thing. So that was what those sorts of steps were, were trying to make sure we did. I don't think this prevents that, that level of detail. So either it needs to have a bunch more columns inserted right. or we need to mm -hmm. split the form. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, if the board decides they want to go this route, um, my suggestion would be we have uh, we look once the budget's adopted. Well, get the input as we're developing the CIP for the uh, upcoming year um, from the board and the finance committee, and then once the budget's adopted for that next year, we would need, I think, to have a work session um, early on first or second meeting in January where we identify <clears throat> all the new projects that are planned for 2012 and then uh, determine what point the board wants to see the project. I mean, we have to do design work for the projects. I don't think, mm -hmm. um, but we don't want to spend money on a project that... And for things that are budgeted, we know that we know that there's sort of the go-ahead to start doing something about design work. Well, but we have had a few things come up that weren't in the budget, and so in that step, in that stage, we might need to have a first, first order of meeting for the board that says, yeah or no, spend some time or don't spend some time. Can you That's give me an example of one of those? Yeah. Um, did we have something in the with? Budget and it I thought we had something like. Um, it was something that came up from, from the citizens. Nope, I can't think of it. Okay. Well, I mean, it'd be good to know what you're rare. thinking about because typically I mean, we've I'm got enough to do stuff. as far as CIP projects that we don't need to add anything to our plate. So we are only looking at those items that are approved in the upcoming year to start to begin our design work and stuff. But I mean, there may be an emergency instance that comes right. up that we have. I think the only one I'm thinking of is when Dana's kid came up and said, we should have a BMX thing in our town. And it wasn't in the budget at that time. It was something that, that we said, oh, that does sound kind of interesting. And he just proposed it. Well, what um, we did was we sent it. it into something else. But no, we sent it to uh, ProStack for it to be looked at with other things. And that's really first step and so I don't think I think that's too early to be doing this kind of thing for an idea. But I mean if, if he had said something like we should have a BMX and none of us was at all interested, then why would we send it anywhere else or, you know, why would we have staff spend any time on it? I why couldn't you have if you sent it to Pro Staff for review, have it be one of the first items on here so they could look at it. That's and put a timeline that we want to have Pro Staff review this by this date. Maybe it's three months out, but you still at least start the tracking process. And that's, yeah, that does try to, yeah, we try to have it so that that could be the first step. When there are items in the budget, um, do you spend money to actually um, do the design phase of it? Mm -hmm. You do. Mm -hmm. So once it's in the budget, whether it's been approved or not, you do spend it. And if it's over it. A certain, you know, if it's over the manager's approval threshold, twenty-five thousand, that contract for design work is going to come to the board. So, wait a minute. Um, I always looked at the budget as um, preliminary, and yeah, like placeholder. A placeholder. That's, I, maybe it'll happen. Maybe it past. won't. It's something we're thinking about. Not necessarily we're going to do. Maybe someone will get water this month, and maybe they won't. That that puts staff in a tough. Yeah. Position I think it's because important. it's in the let's say okay we're 2011 budget right it's in there and we take that as we need to get it done in 2011 because that's when the uh, the funds have been appropriated the board's approved the budget if we don't begin work I mean some of these projects are take a while to complete right. design complete by the end of the year so if we wait um, for the board to say, yeah, we do want you to go, then we may not get it done in time, and, and then we're asked why it wasn't just done in 2011, and now we got to appropriate funds in 2012 because we didn't get it done. So. And that's what the whole discussion, lengthy discussions in the board, in the budget process are supposed to be. Yeah, that's why it's so important for staff to make sure 
when something's in the budget for the next year that it's got at least a first level approval. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah conceptual but conceptual <laughs> approval. I guess. Yeah, but From I think we're all okay with conceptual yeah. approval. But I'm not okay with that being presumed project approval. I mean, some of these are major. The, the, the uh, wind turbine, for example, um, um, to me that is a major town expenditure that I don't think has come before the board has, uh, for. No, for, for, uh, no, I mean, it, it's, it's got, been in the budget. It's, it's uh, in the budget, right. but it, it needs board here. approval. No, no. It was in there the year before too. Really? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's been there a while. Yep, yep. So, is there a presumption that that's a go-ahead, or is that project coming before the board? Yeah, I mean, staff is once, like I said, once those are in, that's why oh. it's important that we get that input from the board. I mean, the budget is a very important document. Correct. Uh, and especially when it comes to CIP projects, uh, if there's any question. By majority of the board about CIP project, I would say flag it and either push it out to a later year so we can have more discussion or, or you know, budget next year for just the design work. Maybe you just want to spend money in 2011 for design work, and then once you see the design, then you can say, Yeah, okay, let's budget money in 2012 for the construction. But yeah, if it's, if it's in the budget, that's how it's been tradition. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Remind me when we get to that budget part in the town board meeting that um, we flag something and uh, maybe consider it as maybe a design element or something that we uh, get information on and maybe not execute the entire project. So how do we bring that all back to this and make something? So better? yeah. Um, so the first step, I'm repeating myself, but the first step is. Uh, getting that input as we're going through the budget development. And then I think um, it will be to have a work session would be my recommendation in the first month of the year to look at the projects that have been identified as new projects, CIP projects, for that year to determine um, do you, I mean, what committees do you want it to go to? Um, should it go to the Planning Commission? Do you want to see it multiple times at the board? Or do you want to approve the, the design contract, even if it's, you know? And we don't have to wait till the first month of the year. We just have to wait till the budget's approved. Mm -hmm. Right. So and you might yeah. present them to us. We might say, okay, we want no. These are the first half of the year. That's as many as we can bite off for now. And then mm -hmm. another meeting after maybe March or something where we deal with the second half of the year or something like that. I can see it actually incorporated on an ongoing basis in work sessions, mm -hmm. where as you you get a proposed, uh, let's call this a project worksheet, if you will. Um, as you propose a project worksheet for project A, B, and C, we take them up and. Uh, work session, go through them, and we agree on the process for those. And then another work session, when you've got D&E &E done, you put them uh, forth to us, et cetera, because each of them will, could be quite unique, depending on the nature of the project. So I guess I don't see any, uh, this is intended to be a, a supremely flexible uh, project. And I certainly agree with Trustee Hansen that um, no matter how big or small, as a tracking device, um, it's probably best to fit virtually everything into a project worksheet so that if, for example, on the, um, the BMX uh, golf example, if, in fact, we gave it to ProStack and ProStack said, ah, interesting idea, but not now, that uh, in two years somebody may ask, whatever happened to that BMX um, project that was brought up a couple of years ago. You turn back earlier in the book of project worksheets and it's got it logged there. Went to ProStack, ProStack decided not now, you know. So we know and it, it, it's an ongoing uh, historical record. And I think, um, especially from ProStack, I think they do go through that annually on, on what CIP projects mm -hmm. um, they would like to see in future years uh, as far as the budget development. 
So um, we're getting that input from them, I know. So, uh, but it's good to document, I think. Yeah, Lisa, and on this mm -hmm. on this form here, does it have a space where on each line item where you could put notes? So if you're in a meeting with whoever's responsible for a certain portion of the project. You can write notes during the meeting and say, "Okay, here's where they are. They missed this deadline, but this is the reason why." So that we can, you can see at any given time what's going on with each critical date. Easily in Taliban. Yeah. Okay. You easily label that notes or status or something like that. Yeah. Well, we will know until we try it. Right, and right. you went through an example. Maybe you can walk us through that. Um, right, I had uh, Jay Wolforth put this together, um, an example for us. And um, basically, he um, came up with the Rock Creek underpass. I think it's one of the 2011 projects that we have. And then he has a going to um, the, you know, the staff development uh, with the board, and uh, it's like January. Um, and then uh, it jumps to the design work. Um, and then we, he's got a work session and then board discussion. And the grant application. And then out to bid. And then it's like my purple park. Huh? So my purple park. Yeah. yeah. So that one, that plan, the way he has it planned here, it doesn't, it doesn't look like it goes to a any committee, and it doesn't look like it has a hearing. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. But not every project needs to go to. Committee. No, no. I'm yeah, just saying yeah, yeah. that's. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I agree or disagree or whatever, but that, that's okay. <laughs> it so doesn't go to planning committee <coughs> because it's not structural. Well, there's. An, I mean. Uh, it I'm doesn't go to the planning commission. Well, this is kind of is a minor yeah. public improvement. Okay. So just, I mean, just yeah, there's no to, need to right. try to yeah. make sense of it. Yeah. 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 That would be the that would be unless we changed in my absence the chapter 16 wording minor was right. the yeah. distinction versus major part. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. But it needs to get done aesthetically, anyways, at the right. very least. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> And you said you did another example as well? Uh, yeah, I, um, this one was um, soil conditioning, which is for the, which is Parks is doing this um, for the trees. And we have the staff development um, and then review direction by the, the board, the town board. Um, and he's, and then the engineering design work. Back to the town board for review and discussion. Um, and it's, it's similar to the Rock Creek underpass and, uh, bid to work and then award of the bid so and that would be pretty different from what we might do for instance for town 9 <coughs> right yes yeah. we would have a lot more of these steps mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. then you would have input I would imagine from ProStack and Citizens. Review by the Planning Commission if you wanted. You'd have outreach Citizen steps meetings. beforehand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Citizen meetings, correct. Yeah. Well, I like it. I do too. I see you start to use it. Yeah. So maybe we should schedule a, either work on a project or two here or something. Because we haven't approved the budget. So. Right. Yeah, that's going to be the first step. And then I think what, uh, from staff's perspective, what we'll do is we'll do. <clears throat> we'll go through the 2011 budget. And you'll and give us job ones to start with? And then we change. We'll do all the new projects. Um, and then we get to say, oh, and we wanted to go to three committees instead of just one or something. Well, um... Or zero. Right. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you guys so. want, are willing to start with it, that'd be great. It's going to be, uh, and it'll take us a little time because <clears throat> Parks and Public Works have quite a few projects, so um, I can't promise that we'll have it by the end of the year, but we're going to definitely need something by the first of the year. And you can stage them also. I mean, do the early ones first and then... Yeah, because some, some are time sensitive. Exactly. Um, 
but we and some may be ones that are going to take a really long time, you know, with public meetings and stuff like that. So we might do those up front too. And we might find, I don't know how the board feels about it, but we might find as we're going through this, <clears throat> it may delay projects. It may. Well, and we'll have to make those choices. Yeah. Or it may rush them. No, I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's going to rush them. <laughs> it's either they stay on track or they're going to delay them. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. because there's depending on how much. Depends on how much. Because you know, your the advisory. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the positive thing about this is it's complete transparency. Everybody knows exactly what's going on. Everybody's on the same page. It's it's uh, there's a kind of built-in transparency, which I think is the, mm -hmm. one of the things that we can improve upon. Uh, I really like it, Lisa. You've done a great job. Okay, not just Sandy. me. Yeah, Sorry. you did a very good job. Sandy and Lisa. Yeah, it's actually been other people too. Yep. So Sandy and I have been yeah. very heavily. Involved. Thank you to everyone involved. Yeah, everyone, yeah, it's, it looks really good. And I like the fact that we can say, oh, you know, I thought I was going to go to something other. But we all agreed this, these were going to be the steps. You know? <laughs> and it's right there, yeah. yeah. And once we create these for the jobs, is there any way that we can um, post them on our website so others yeah, can? Yeah, I mean, there's other cities that have um, capital improvement um, status uh, pages on their website, so we could probably do something like that. There are pluses and minuses with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the well, schedules. Uh, complete transparency. Um, yeah, you know, you may have something on your website, and if it's not updated every day, it may not match with the work that's actually going on. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we have to be careful about that too, because it sets ex expectations exactly. of the public. Yeah. Right. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. But it's not bad to track them periodically and know that you're. No, well, periodically. On the game or not? Update on the game. once a week or once a month or whatever. Just. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah. And uh, we'll we'll work through these spreadsheets, um, but we may use this one or modify this one depending on um, input from the departments and mm -hmm. which they feel is easier um, for them to use or modify. So. The only the only reason we didn't end up with something like that, I think. In talking with everybody is because some projects may need to go a couple of loops through. You might want to go to planning commission, then board, then planning commission, or something like that. And so, if you have just set things like that, it's, it's a little mm -hmm. trickier. So that yeah, I hear you. this allowed differences in timing. Okay. We did. It doesn't seem like there's a rote process yet. Maybe there should. Maybe there shouldn't be. But in any case, there's not one. The form will adapt to the process. Mm -hmm. It'll have to, yeah. yeah. And there will be some of the other. The process will adapt to the form to the extent in which it be, can be made more efficient by the form. But, you know, I don't think we want to add any inefficiency to the process no. um, because of this form. So uh, we only want it to work positively towards the town's goals. And it's important for staff to have that clear direction. I think I think everybody benefits from that. Yeah. And and what also helps me is um, knowing what got decided. You know, the project got stalled six months ago, and I can't remember what it is we really did decide. And right. to have this be in our little packet or something that shows where the little X's were done and not done and whatever would really just sort of jump me right to the front of the class again. You know, I'd be right with the rest of the class. Mm -hmm. Because they are, you know, essentially volunteers and I don't remember everything, so. Thank you. Can we talk a little bit about the agenda for next, our next meeting? There's some big stuff coming up. Would bring us to item number three. Um, let's see. May I ask a question about 3C, Matt? How do you see that? You know, that's such a huge chapter. How do? What is a preliminary reading of a chapter that big? Well, um, at the last work session, work session, we it was decided that we would not have it on the consent like we typically do for a preliminary mm -hmm. reading. 
but we would put it on a, as a regular agenda item. And we'll have staff will have a list of <clears throat> significant items that have been revised based on the board's two work sessions, and then any responses to questions that may be outstanding based on those two meetings, and then um, we, as the board wishes, we can go through each of those items um, and any other questions that may come up when you get your revised chapter 16. I guess how many items do you anticipate there will be? Well, we, plan, we don't plan on listing all the just minor edits, spelling, and that type of thing. So um, the significant items uh, will probably be, you know, I would say anywhere between 20 and 30, I would think, just from memory. Going back to you. And are those, oh, sorry, are you, Trustee Pennington, are you? I'm mauling. <laughs> Go ahead. So my, my question about that was, so are you talking about 20 or 30 changes from the old 16 to now, or 20 or 30 changes assuming everybody read what came to the board, and then the changes that the board made? I think he's talking 20 to 30 issues that need discussion by the board, possibly. Based on their two work sessions. So people will have had to do their homework to know what else got changed before that. Uh, we'll try our best okay. to make sure we describe that as, as best as we can. Okay. Thanks. Um, but we are working on this, uh, and I can't guarantee we'll have it done by the 25th. It may get pushed to the first meeting in November. Okay. Um, would it be um, feasible since 20 to 30 issues to go through at any one meeting is well, quite, it'll be two meetings. Yeah, right. but I mean, if you have, let's say, the first 10 to 15 issues that could be addressed at the October 25th meeting, and then the next. Well, what I had planned was we would have the entire list and we'd just get through as many as, okay. as the board wishes to, and mm -hmm. uh, with the understanding that we have a second reading coming up. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah, some of them what I was trying to say is don't delay the whole thing till a later date if oh, you've got the first that. 10 or 15 um, ready to discuss October 25th. Yeah, was, we have quite Let's a bit that. going on right now. Okay, I, you know, okay. Uh, well, the 25th, it's either which way works. Positive. Okay. Did you have a specific? I do. I'll let Matt go through it. And then. Um, and then we have the Next two items, D and E, are on Community Park East. Anybody has any questions on those? Yes. Is um, D approving the entire park? Um, it is approving. Um, What's the difference between them other than that one is very specific and the other one is uh, more general? Yeah, we'll put, we can put more description in there, but I believe it's the bridge. The dog park, the parking lot. Um, it's the country. Are there anything else I'm forgetting? No, that's, that's those are the three the main ones. Area. And the, yeah, in the entry area. Yeah. So th those items. Mm -hmm. And then the lee lights for the design and construction management for the bike. This is the RFP they course. put out that. Right. Which we asked for. Yeah. yeah. So we'd be seeing mm -hmm. the proposed award of that RFP, I guess, is. And the only thing that's not covered with that, I think, is the, the disc golf, because that wasn't part of the RFP, if I'm correct. Correct, yeah. yeah. Right. Disc so, golf, more or less, is done complete. So D would be bringing a complete design forward, or? Thanks. Or is it just a few components? Well, it's um, complete except for the bike skills course. Okay. Right. Yeah. It's a contract. Yes, a contract. What said. Yeah, contract for construction <coughs> of those elements. And then the economic development committee, Chris. Yeah, that might get pushed out again. I've been researching other uh, economic development committees in other towns. Uh, just got a return call back from CML and a woman at downtown Colorado 
So we have yet to discuss our options. So I don't think I'm going to be ready by then to okay. push forward. But I am doing quite a bit of research on it, so okay. I think I'll let you know. All right. We wanted. Uh, we just want to make sure we had it on there as a place. I appreciate in case. it. Thank you. In the rec on H, the recommendation to Boulder County has that been developed already, or um, or how is that being developed? Is that yeah, that's yours for the future trails and acquisitions. Do you yeah, want to? Sure. Well, I need it. Sorry. The Open Space Advisory Committee has already put a recommendation together for Boulder County's annual um, uh, information. So, so what would be next is bringing the recommendation to, to the board to say yay or nay. And it, there's just one addition uh, to their recommendation that changes from last year, and that's a recommendation um, for some additional work on the Hodgson-Harris piece. So Matt, we just keep on the yeah, one yeah. that I had concern about was the tenant services. What's mm -hmm. the uh, what's being proposed? Uh, we received two proposals, I believe, for our um, request for services. Um, one was is with the current um, tennis prop, and the other one is with um, Billy Downs tennis. Um, and have you completed a review, or are you still going through those? Um, we sorry, thanks. <laughs> For those who are interested in watching. Uh, we went through an extensive process for uh, that evaluation, so uh, we're still in the final phases of, of um, a recommendation for you um, coming up next week. So. Okay. We well, put together, one eight and our staff put together a um, detailed evaluation form that I think you have two other staff or three staff? Yeah, three staff total input. were on the selection committee. Um, there were five different areas uh, to um, be evaluated on. Uh, three major areas were the proposal itself, uh, an actual interview, and then an on-the-court uh, type interview. But there, it, it, it was a very um, long and very objective process. Okay, that's the key word because I have felt for a time that Billy Downs has not been treated objectively, so I'm concerned that this will happen to him again. And that would mean that I wasn't treating him objectively. Well, you know what, I feel like uh, this 2010, the tense has been a disaster in a lot of ways. I mean, Billy has been in our community for a long time, and he did a great job for a long time, but he, he wasn't perfect. I understand that there were complaints, and they were, I don't know if anyone in this room is perfect in everything that they do professionally. I mean, I, I just don't believe that's true. So when he was kind of let go, you know, I don't want to go and repeat what happened this past year, but it's, it has been problematic for me. And then, uh, you know, the RFP went out. He was the only one that actually took the time and, you know, did his part. Nobody else showed up. And somehow we found a way to do another RFP. And I would, so I just want to make sure that he's treated fairly because he has been a big part of this community. And for a long time, he's done a very good job. So, And, you know, as staff, when we, I mean, we want to provide the best service to the residents and the community um, for whatever service it might be and, and at the best cost. Or, um, so I, they, you know, there's a lot been going on with the tennis um, services and RP and things in the past, and um, you know, I, I, we are looking at them closely, okay. and, and we'll make a recommendation based on what we think is best for the, for the community. I'm okay. I just want him to be treated fairly. Mm -hmm. That's all. <clears throat> so we'll wait and see. <coughs> Weekly digest. Um, <coughs> next is the weekly digest. I don't know if anybody had any.
I really like that a lot, by the way. I want to tell you that the weekly digest is really good. Well, there's a lot. There's, there's a there. lot, so yeah. I think if it's too yeah. much, I'm No, it's, it's never too much, actually. The more information you give us, the better. I, did not do, I said that earlier. You did? Yep. Okay. The exact same thing, word for word. Um, race, don't skip the bike race if you're going through it. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> we uh, submitted our TIP application for the interchange, the Northeast Loop that we still fighting for. Um, <clears throat> we're, we should hear something from Dr. Cog early next spring. Um, okay. If we get any type of feedback or hear anything, we'll, we'll give you an update. But um, Let's see. Uh, so we confirmed the date for our, the board's meeting with ProStack on November 1st at 6 right. p.m. Thank, Thank you very much. Yep. Here at the town board, and I think we'll have dinner. So. Or I, I don't know. I said that, Phyllis. Did I say it? I don't. No, okay. It's on the record now. Eat before you come. And I won't be able to be there, but okay. yeah, I'm sorry for that. Um, I'm not coming back for that. The uh, Heather Craycraft has picked this one up for me um, as far as working on the bike race. Um, we submitted our letter of support and interest and. Hope to hear good news back in the middle of October for that. Um, Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Um, did we take a different approach than was requested, or just I had the impression we weren't really submitting a detailed yes, proposal? Yes, I think you're correct on that. I mean, you know, what I wasn't involved in the in the letter that was sent, um, but. Other communities did a tour, and you know, um, we didn't do anything like that. We submitted the letter stating all the good things we did this year with the bike race we've done, and the history of the course, and all that. Um, but we didn't do the on-site tour and stuff like that that other communities did. I hope that was good enough. <laughs> I mean, we do have something special that other communities don't yep. have, so that's. I think at the end of the day, the, they'll either select us or we'll run our own race would be my impression. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference, though? It would be good to be part of a bigger race. It would be good to be part of the bigger race because there's more the professional, rise, the professional riders are at a different caliber if you, right. in that bigger race. Right. Okay. Um, we scheduled Tim Van Meter for the next work session to go through... Uh, Give an overview of the town center vision and his perspective on that process that we went through and, and answering questions of the board. So, um, yeah, I think it'll be good for the new board members. Yeah, to good meet to him and yeah, absolutely. Tim back. He was he was good for that process. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the county has uh, secured the, enough water lease uh, irrigation water for the to fill the reservoir to the level that the state agreed to. So. That was good. So where does that compare to where it was? Um, um, it's 30 big. acre feet. Um, just 10 just like vertical 65 feet. Right, something. yeah. Um, and it was at 50 vertical feet. So it's going to be one it's fifth of where it was. 50 or 40. I thought it was 60 or 50 to 60 acre feet before. Right, so not I mean it's okay. not to the levels that it once it's was, but it was I mean. High. And will it ever be at that level again? Not based that, on the repair costs that, that the counties looked at. It, that's too bad. The, the, um, the cost to repair it to that level doesn't, it outweighs the gains. So, Lisa, what would you say it was 50 to 60? I think they said it was 50 to 60 acre feet before, and now we're at 30 right now. But 10 acre, uh, 10 feet is what... Um, they add the proponents of that were would accept correct right I mean I think the residents there would like more um, but it, it, this is a, a right okay and is this one they're getting from us we're leasing it back to no them. they no, had contacted us and we told them that we would be willing to you know pro provide a lease uh, for whatever excess water we had but um, they had already secured it okay. before they called us back so. <clears throat> So this is going to be filled to the level about half of what it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Good. 
enough to hope, hopefully keep the migrating fowl with yeah. a, a, something in their brain that says stop here. Uh, the county parks department has scheduled a ribbon cutting for October 14th at 3 p.m. and it's just going to be here on the west end of town. Um, if you plan on attending, let us know ahead of time. Okay. Okay. And we'll make sure that the county staff knows that you're going to be there. I cannot be there, Matt. Yeah, I can't okay. be there. Okay. Not looking good for me either. I think I'd probably yes. Okay. And Joe, you said you would, or no? It's right now. It's not looking okay. good. Okay. Yeah. If I got home in time, I would go. But I'm not expecting. Mr. Sure. Jim. Jim. Um, Mr. Payne. Oh yeah. Jim Payne, 2475 Clayton Circle, uh, Pro Stack Chair. I just wanted to make a suggestion on that subject, and that is um, that the board designate, make sure that elected officials are there. They, they, there was a similar event three weeks ago, which was the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the Rock Creek and Pole Creek Trails, and uh, the other towns had their elected officials who spoke and we didn't, weren't represented. So I, I suggest you have some process where if the mayor can't attend, you attend, if you can't attend, trustees and it's clear who's, who's going to speak if that's called for. So they could just be good for the, mm -hmm. for the town. Um, then I want to highlight uh, a couple items um, from our Parks Department. Uh, the town received a, a Starburst Award from uh, lottery funds for the Ted Assey Historical Park that, that uh, the town completed. So we were recognized for um, that new park, which is always nice to receive that recognition by his staff. That was um, great work. It's a great job. It looks awesome. And then El Dorado, I don't know, um, probably all of you realize the new tennis courts at El Dorado KA. Mm -hmm. Staff attended that ribbon cutting, so it's nice to have those new courts. And then um, the last thing I wanted to mention was the county commissioner's dinner, scheduled for October 27th at 5.30 here in the boardroom. And we'll work with the county on an agenda, and if there's any... Uh, items that the board has specifically we'll send you suggestions talk to them about that yeah. Matt the only thing on that is that's right prior to the election and there could be some changes right in those county commissioners uh, Cindy Domenico's oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's possible yeah. I, I, was, I, I don't think there's any term limited but I, yeah, I, I I'd be yeah. surprised if she doesn't but that's a possibility yeah. but um, I think it's still good to have okay. it because these days are tough to Come by, so. Yeah. And on the retreat, when you're scheduling dates in um, November, mm -hmm. I'm out till November 13th. Okay. Well, so hopefully, the last half will work. In the middle part of November, I probably won't be here. Right. Like the 15th to the 17th oh. or 15th to the 18th. That's just a weekend, though. Uh, it's oh, wait, I'm looking at You're right. I looked out until then. And I'll be up from the 19th for the 29th. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, it is November. Yeah, and, and I will as well. If Thanksgiving. So November 30th Thanksgiving. is looking pretty good. Well, I'll have Phyllis. Uh, I'll have Phyllis in some dates, so. Yeah, right, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. We'll try to get it done. I think that was it. Okay. We don't want to Basically, between the 13th and the 19th. He's going to the 15th. Yeah, he's going to the 13th. We've got to do this for you. Okay, thanks. Take a seven minute break. Thanks for your advice.
about the software. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to call, uh, call to order a regular meeting of the Town of Superior Board of Trustees for October 11, 2010. And Phyllis, if you'd call the roll. Sure. Mayor, Pro Mayor Andrew Bucco. Here. I had myself. Mayor Pro Tem Amy Gregoras. Here. Trustees Joe Sorelli. Here. Chris Hansen. Here. Sandy Penny. Here. Lisa Scoobins. Here. Deborah Williams. Here. Uh, intern Town Manager Matt Bagley. Here. Town Attorney Kendra Carberry. Here. Town Clerk Cole Sergeant. And number three, approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? I'm going to have questions about uh, the clear uh, clear uh, wireless, so I think that that needs to come back at the next meeting then, because okay. I don't think I can ask, right? You, 
Well, let me see. Do you, do you want to call it up? Yep. Okay. Then we'll put, let's remove it from the consent and we'll call it up and that will be set at that time. Perfect. So would that be D and E? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, we don't want to approve the lease until Correct. we deal with the permit. Any other changes to tonight's agenda? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Trustee Scott Master to approve the agenda as a second. Trustee Gross. Further discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. That brings us to item number four reports, questions, and issues. Trustee Pennington. Um, oh, the only thing I have for tonight is uh, well done to Ed and staff um, on the repair of the burst pipe on Coal Creek. Some residents actually watched the process and re were very pleased with it. So kudos to them. That's all. Uh, no question, just a brief comment that it's nice to see you here and it's been a smooth transition, so we appreciate that. Thank you. Trustee Williams? I echo that as well. Thank you for making this very smooth. Um, I also attended a historical commission uh, walking tour um, with historical points throughout uh, original town and a tour of the industrial mine on October 1st and I thank the Historical Commission for doing a fabulous job and there were at least at least 50 people maybe more than that um, that attended so thank you very much Historical Commission that's all I have I attended a U.S. 36 and Mayors and Commissioners meeting, talking uh, it was a meeting with RTD um, staff. Uh, there is approximately $300 million left over from the Eagle P3 project, which is the uh, west side of town. And RTD is uh, trying to decide what exactly to do with that money. We're lobbying to have some of that money advanced into the U.S. 36 corridor, but they haven't made that decision. That's probably a couple of months away. That's all I had. Trustee Skomets. Um, I think the only thing that has of significance that's come up in the last um, since the last meeting is uh, I attended the CML policy meeting and there were a number of proposals that got put. It's it's a completely new process over what it was in the past, and um, they asked towns and communities or whoever to bring forth ideas they wanted to see as part of the legislature or things that they were potentially going to have a, a um, legislator bring forward. And there were quite a few things, some of which were fairly well cooked and some which weren't at all cooked, but just sort of broad conceptual things. Um, the, those um, items were brought forward and, and sort of, I don't want to say argued, but presented in a sense. Um, um, and the, there were, there were um, among the things that were fairly cooked, I think the things that um, the positions were developed for, for the um, CML to support um, or oppose or or in some cases actually bring forward were a couple like supporting a, a bringing um, putting sales tax for short-term rentals in ski community sort of things uh, there's there's an issue where if you rent a, a rent something through the web it doesn't end up with the same tax same authorities or same oversight or pretty much anything is if you rent it from a, a local rental company. So there was something about making that more, um, the CL was looking at making, um, supporting that. The municipal, municipal clerks had a very well designed and um, uh, long thought out and long argued process for uh, making the issuance of special perm event permits happen only at the local community instead of going through the state as well, which took so long that they often weren't, weren't timely. There are a couple others, um, and I'm happy to provide a summary to the board on those sorts of things. One had to do with, I think, cri doing criminal background checks and some cleanups on the medical marijuana thing also. Because mm -hmm. apparently it right now doesn't require background checks. Oops. Anyway. Huh. Trustee Cerilli? Uh, nothing to report. From you. Uh, the only thing I have is just want to thank staff for uh, the repaving of the parking lot at, uh, and the basketball court on Indiana. Uh, but I also wanted to see if it's possible that we can make that a dedicated basketball court, perhaps put up a perimeter so that it could be used for parking so people who want to play basketball wouldn't be competing with parking on the weekends and in the evenings. And if we could do that, maybe send it to ProStack and have them investigate how we go about doing that. And in a way that 
doesn't trip the players, is there? <laughs> sure. Great, well, they're nice. Phyllis? Mr. Magley? Ms. Garberry? Nothing for me, thanks. That brings us to item number five, public comment on consent agenda and non-agenda items. George Kuffner, 109 Southport. Uh, pertaining to your water break, I think maybe you better send that piece of pipe in and have it analyzed to see if we have any more problem spots down the road if that's uh, caused from corrosion or if it's caused from being hit, what started the corrosion. Uh, something happened there with that ductile pipe. I, and I can't tell you exactly what, and I've worked on ductile pipe for a good many years. Uh, it looked like it blew out because it was corrosion. I ate it and it just went. And if you'll notice down Coal Creek, we have many more low spots where this has probably been faller pipe down on down Coal Creek. So if you look a little closer, where that broke, it, there was no low spot in the road where that broke. I mean, like we have down below. Uh, I want to talk to six. You want me to wait till six comes up? Uh, yes. Six A or whatever. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mr. Town Manager and Board. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, Trustees. Uh, my name is Bob Momarts. I'm president of the Saddlebrook at Rock Creek HOA, and um, I'm here primarily to bring you the status as to what's going on with the reservoir. Um, Come in about a week, there's going to be um, 30 acre feet of water uh, run into the reservoir. And this is part of a short term solution, not a permanent one. Uh, the main uh, purpose is to restore aesthetics and make sure we don't lose uh, the birds by interrupting their migratory patterns and what have you. In the meantime, while the um, state has agreed to allow 10 foot depth, which is roughly 30 acre feet, maybe 32 acre feet behind the uh, dam. Uh, the county has to build a particular kind of drain, design it, build it, and install it. Uh, the reservoir will have to be drained in order to install this particular piece of uh, equipment and then partially refilled. Um, I've been told that that will take place over the winter I'm not sure when the refilling is going to take place. They're not sure either. Then it's going to take anywhere from 6 to 12 months where they're going to um, revisit all of the uh, various approaches which had been engineered nine years ago. And, and they'll also be uh, consider a new one. And then uh, they've got to talk money. And then they've got to talk um, <laughs> whether or not filling it all the way is really the optimal um, use of the property. Uh, for instance, a lot of the birds are shore birds. Well, they have to have a shore. Uh, so if you fill it all the way up to the top the way it was originally designed uh, 100 years ago, then you're somewhat defeating part of the purpose of why you want to make sure there's water in there. So these are all things that have to be uh, fine-tuned. Um, I'm not sure what the impact of the, the um, issue was at 2B or something like that in this coming election is going to be in terms of the mill levy for open space maintenance and what have you. Um, I don't think it's going to impact this. I think that they um, are pretty much going to embrace the notion that this is more than just an agricultural interest, uh, that they have to look beyond it. It's bigger than just what it was uh, historically, these kinds of issues. Um, <coughs> What I was curious about is that they're going to be setting up a stakeholders meeting or a series of them. And I presume that since this is within the town limits and it affects the town, whether, I mean, if that reservoir is full and lush and beautiful, then that helps the town. If it's uh, an ugly mud hole, it doesn't help the town. I think it's that pretty basic. Um, if the town gets invited as a stakeholder, which I presume it will be, um, has the town considered any position that it's going to take or who is going to be speaking for the town in that regard or whether or not there's going to be any uh, discussion or public forum 
uh, to address those particular points because uh, the implication of Mr. Stewart's uh, communication is that the idea of stakeholders meetings are forthcoming. Now, granted, in a semi-political environment, forthcoming can mean anything from next week to next year and beyond, but um, I think if he's pretty much uh, taken a bit in the mouth in this particular project and is moving it along uh, as satisfactorily as we could have hoped for. I mean, there's water back in it after being drained about six weeks, six, eight weeks ago, so from that standpoint, we're all thrilled. Um, but what we'd like to do is get a permit solution, and in part, we need the support of the town of Superior as well. Trustee comments. So, actually, I was hoping that you would bring up the fact that they did commit to a public process, and I, the way everything I've talked to and heard from Mr. Stewart was that they, they are committing to a public process at, or a stakeholder process, and that town of Superior will be involved. I, I also haven't seen how it's crafted. It's hard to figure out how we should react to something that isn't yet sort of, I guess we could provide some input, but that oh. might be perceived. Yeah, I quite, I quite agree with what you're saying, that, you know, maybe getting a, I was glad they committed to a process a, a, and that a, we would be involved. Yeah, maybe discussion of uh, specifics would be premature, but maybe some looking into the future in terms of how are we going to approach this structurally, you know, within the town government or whether it falls under the auspices of a particular department or committee or something like that might be helpful so that if it does get launched, uh, that we don't have a lot of downtime trying to get up to speed it was really my concern. But thank you very much, unless you have thank any you. additional questions. No. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for staying on top of it. Okay. Um, my name is Maddie Stallman. And um, I am nine years old, and my address is 356 Shawnee Lane. And I'm just sit wanting to say that, really, I think that Superior is a great city to live in. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Maddie. Nice to meet you. And you're a good speaker. Additional public comment. It's a tough act to call. Uh, Gladys four she four four South Third Avenue. Uh, Two. I wanted to tell Matt that I'm glad that things are going relatively smoothly for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I have um, extreme concern about the land use, um, that the residents uh, are going to have ample time to make comments on the changes and that those comments are seriously going to be considered. So I don't know how to get my input in or do I just wait until the hearing and then have them at that time because I do have several comments to make about the land use change code. Um, also on the uh, budget, I, I understand the, the timeline to get it passed and, and all of that, but I think that um, the board needs to drop back and punt until after the election because I think once the election is over, I think there's you know, might be changes that have to be made, and so I, I'm really concerned about all of that, that um, um, getting passed before the election and, and all those changes. So I, I, I'm asking that the board maybe take a second breath and drop back and wait till after the election on any action on that. Um, now you pulled clear wire. I had one comment about that. I hold that until it comes up again. All right. Um, I want to make a comment also about the bike race, whatever decisions that are being made about the bike race, that it stays out of original town. And that's all I will say. I think the bike race is excellent for Superior. I have no problems with it. Keep it out of original town. That's my thing. I will curtail it at that. 
A Richland Town residence did a petition and turned it in uh, to the town board here a while back. I'm wanting to know when uh, that is going to be discussed by the board and the Public Works Department has been working on our driveways in um, the South Edition uh, and he can only do so much. So I'm wanting to know when that petition, our issues can be discussed and looked at, reviewed, action taken, whatever. Uh, so this has to do with the driveways and the... It has uh, to do with the streets. And the curb. So, just so it's clear, though, which which issue is that that you want to bring up? It has to do with the drainage and the driveways, or the alleyway, or which one? Uh, no, no alleyways. Alleyways is a totally separate uh, issue from that petition. Uh, the petition was um, the driveways, which uh, they are being. Uh, most of them have been worked on. There's been. Um, um, cuts put in the curbs and, and driveways put in that was told that that would be done and, and that sort of thing uh, but there's that excess money that was not used in North original town that we asked to have a review done to see if any of that money could be used in South Edition to redo our streets and return them to the way they were before this disastrous project two years ago i.e. width, taking out the curb, all of that. So I'm wanting to know, I mean, this has been gone on now, nobody said anything about it, uh, and, and there's been all extracurricular activity, and, and I understand that, uh, but um, our petitions before that we've turned in have been totally ignored, and I'm going to tell you that is a massive thorn with me. There is no reason why they cannot be discussed. And I would like to know when original town residents South Edition can have our petition addressed. Well, the, the issue can be addressed at any time. The question is whether or not the board is going to expend funds to, to change what's there right I now. I understand so. that, and I clearly stated that. My thing is, when can those petitions be discussed? Once again, any, any time. So can we get it on the agenda for uh, the next meeting? Well, the, the question is what exactly you're asking for, if you're asking to have well, money Well, read the petition, and because it clearly states in that petition. Okay. That would be up to the board whether or not they want to do a CIP project in original town. So that's up to the board. Can we discuss the uh, petition in a work session? session? Certainly, if you like. Okay. Should That's we start what there? I would suggest. Yeah. Okay. We'll take a look at the schedule. Our next meeting we have Tim Van Meter, which is mm -hmm. going to take the whole work session. So right. we'll, we'll come to November. The one, after that. the one after that? Okay. okay. So when will we have? When will residents have a uh, reply that to see it on a work session? Uh, as soon as staff can figure out what date that will be. Yeah. You'll email because we'll have we'll have to have some we'll have to prepare some right. information for the board to review. So there'll be time there too. So, but I'll let you know when we have a date. And be assured if I don't hear, I'll be back. Okay. Additional public comments? Hello, Matt. George Kuffner, 7520 West Cole Creek Drive. I come to talk a little bit about the budget. I don't know if we've already okayed it totally, 100%. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the way I read it, we got $1,750,000 in there to buy a wind generator. Actually, it's. Three point five. five. No. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. At any rate, years a few years back, it's been I don't know maybe four or five years ago. I had a friend that lived here, and owned an X-ray company here, and they decided to build, you know, to move out to California. So he went out there, and, and the first thing they did, they thought everything was so great, they went by there. I guess when you're going into where he was living, 
there's big wind farm deals that just hundreds of propellers. And uh, he bought he bought a wind generator. And uh, after three years, he sold the wind generator and never collected one dividend check. He said instead of sending him a dividend check for the electricity, they'd send him a bill that this needed fixed or that needed fixed. So before we spend that kind of money, I wish we would look, because when I was looking at the budget, I seen no expense after the original purchase to keep her up and rolling and going. And from his experience, what he told me was, it sure didn't make him feel good, but it didn't do nothing for his wallet. And uh, so, I mean, I didn't see anything in the budget, so I don't, I don't know if I missed it or no, looked at the wrong line or what. But I, I wish we would look into after we purchase it, uh, you know, what the upkeep cost or the maintenance cost is going to be versus the electricity that we're pushing. And the only other complaint I kind of got about it is, is not buying it, but we need it in Colorado. We, we need to keep our money at home. And if we have it that close to us, maybe we can even use some of the power that we're creating on our own grid. I mean, I, I, I'm just saying I'd like to see that kind of money stay here because that's a lot of money uh, versus there. And I, But I, I wish we would look at the other end of it too. Yeah, Make sure that it's going to be a profitable situation. I don't know. When just, just to be clear, yeah. so the town's not buying a wind gener generating facility right now. It's in the budget to contemplate, but obviously when we're talking about those types of dollar figures, there will be a long involved process to vet out the pros and the cons. So okay, yeah, I mean, but I mean, I seen it in there. It looked like we were allocating a million seven five. Yeah, and we've done that in the past where we've allocated money for projects, but they didn't happen that okay, year. Be, I'm just saying, and so look just a little bit tighter. Let me make you know. It's beyond the manager's uh, budgetary discretion, I believe. So yeah, be coming to the, be coming to the board. But okay, well, I, you know, I mean, I, I I went down through them and I thought. That's, you know, I mean, it's quite a bit of money. Now it's even twice what I thought, so I'm <laughs> scratching my head and copper they, hand. They generate a considerable amount of renewable energy, too. But, uh, yeah. Well, once again, this will be a, a good discussion when and if it ever comes forward, so. Yeah, nice. but, you know, I mean, race car motor goes fast, but you put new pistons in it every run. I mean, I'm just saying, let's, let's make sure that we're not opening that check, but you know, getting something back in it instead of always going the other way. And then uh, uh, one other thing. I called last Monday, or last Tuesday after the meeting, I called Parks and Rec and asked them for a RFP on the parks down here to get a price. And they said, oh, no problem. They get it to me. Uh, I got it. But I got it on Friday, and the pre-bid was Thursday. <laughs> so the, Kind of waste of me getting the RFP. If they printed it on the fourth and you had a pre-meeting on the seventh, it didn't give much. You know, not. They asked me. I said, "Well, I'll just pick it up when I pick up my packet." And when I picked it up, and I said, well, this is neat. And I got to reading it. Can't, I can't bid because I wasn't at the pre-bid. So a little more notice would be helpful. Okay. Additional public comments. Seeing none, that brings us to item number six presentations. And with us this evening is uh, delightful to have Mr. Abelson from the Rocky Flats. I uh, uh, can't remember the acronym at the moment, so cold. It's not the cold, it's not Riff Gog anymore, but to give us a little update about the history of the flats. Yeah, yeah. Stewart. Stewart, I remember. Yeah. Thank you. Since he introduces himself. Okay. I'm David Abelson. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I uh, um, know a lot of people in this room, probably more than if I went to my own council meeting, a little in Boulder. Um, so thank you for inviting me to the meeting here tonight. Uh, I serve as the executive director of the Rocky Flats Stewardship Council. I've worked on uh, Rocky Flats issues now for 15 years, first for Congressman David Skaggs, then as the executive director of the Rocky Flats um, Coalition of Local Governments, of which the mayor was one of the founding members, and Matt served on his staff capacity for that at various points, and also now is the executive director of the Rocky Flat Stewardship Council. A uh, stewardship council is nine governments. It's uh, Boulder County, uh, City of Boulder, Superior, Broomfield, Westminster, Arvada, North Glen, Jefferson County, and Golden. 
It's also the League of Women Voters, the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum, uh, Rocky Flats Homesteaders, which is a retirees group, and an individual named Arthur Widowfield. Uh, former trustee Karen Beerowitz, when she left the trustee, she served as an individual on that board for a couple of years as well. Uh, we formed in 2006 following uh, cessation of uh, remediation activities at the site. Uh, what I'm about to present is drinking from a fire hose, so I forewarn you. But the only way to really discuss Rocky Flats is to actually just, just sort of try to absorb as much information as possible. Um, and, and I think these are pretty much the last words you will see. It is from there, all photographs. You said the arrow? Yeah. Okay. Um, when Rocky Flats started, uh, it was 1951, and it was on the far edge of town. It was a windswept escarpment. This is Highway 93 in 1954. And you know, it's, it looks obviously a little bit different today than it did back then. Um, here's a picture, and I'm not sure exactly when it is, but it's probably late 50s. Superior would be, this is the southeast Look, excuse me, southwest looking northeast, there's Stanley Lake. So Superior would be somewhere over here. Um, and this was the entrance to the site. And a little bit I'm going to talk about when they dump stuff out back, and that's this area there. Um, and over time, what you know is that communities have grown around Rocky Flats. Rocky Flats itself hasn't moved, but the communities have. Rocky Flats' uh, primary mission was uh, to produce some coding in there, produce nuclear triggers um, in the first step, which was the first step in the weapons production process. Um, and this here is, this is a, a plutonium button. Basically, with hydrogen bombs, you had an explosion to create the energy, then to give the energy for the hydrogen explosion. And they use, they, they produce these triggers here. Working in a glove box, it's lead lines, but there were problems with some of this. A lot of um, workers were, uh, became sick because of work at Rocky Flats. Uh, and here's another production area photo, uh, 1960. This is built in 771, uh, and it was one of the main production buildings. In fact, if you worked in this building, you knew what went on there. But if you didn't work in this building, you didn't actually know what went on there. There was just these incredible walls of secrecy. Uh, and the um, gear, the, what the person's wearing, is it, it varied depending on which building you're in and also which time period it was in terms of understanding about how radioactive and hazardous materials would impact uh, humans on the cellular level. This is a picture. You're going to see three different photographs of this, of this uh, area. It's during production. I, I, I couldn't begin to guess what year it is. This is what's called the XY Retriever. And this is in a building called 707. And there was a storage vault for special nuclear materials. This was you know, as valuable of, of place for Rocky Flats as there were. Uh, the atmosphere in here was um, inert with nitrogen to prevent oxidization of plutonium, which could lead to plutonium fires. And fires were one of the main concerns of Rocky Flats. There were two major ones, 1957 and 1969. This is uh, the 57 fire here. This is uh, building uh, 771, which was the main production building. Um, the filters here, these were plenum, it's, you know, it says it. These were air filter, plenum filters there. Um, and they were removed airborne uh, plutonium contamination. This fire here was the more destructive of the two, and it released more uh, plutonium contamination to the environment than the one in 1969 which is 1969 here. This was a glove box that was burned. And this was the Mother Day, Mother's Day fire. And if you read the history of it, and there's a great book by a uh, journalism professor at CU, Len Ackland, called Making of a Real Killing. And what he really talks about is how Rocky Flats got lucky. It all, the fire almost breached the roof. And if that had, fire had breached the roof, it would just be a very different situation or in terms of uh, this community, in terms of development, in terms of contamination, all sorts of issues. But they put it out. Um, and a couple of things about this. When the building was taken down in 2005, the entire building was, was disposed of as low-level waste. The other thing that's important about this is following this fire, the site was expanded from what was four sections of land, which is 2,560 acres, 
to um, roughly 6,400 acres. And so a lot of more land was purchased, a bigger buffer zone. A lot of land was purchased from the church family, you know, Church Ranch, Charlie McKay. Uh, and a lot of the land that was purchased, and it was over a, a two-year period, 1974 and 1975, was land that was in agricultural production at the time. So what we have here is that when, when you look at Rocky Flats and you look at the main <laughs> sources of environmental contamination, environmental contamination res, res, resulted in a lot of cases from practices that at the time were common and practices that were legal. Right? You think about an industrial facility in the 50s and 60s, and where would they take stuff to, to bury it? They would take it out back. And Rocky Flats had an access road that I pointed out that came in from the west they would literally go dump it out back. They, there were trenches, stuff over a hillside that has this name called the original landfill, but it was just a dump. It was just, you just, you know, off to the side, down a hillside. This here was the 903 pad, and we're going to see a couple of different photos of this. Uh, these drums were, um, were uh, contained liquids that had plutonium, uranium, volatile organic compounds. Uh, in early attempts to clean this, this was the Atomic Energy Commission, they realized they have a problem, they removed the drums, and they went and they got these scrapers. Now, if one thing we all know about this area is that it tends to be windy. And what happened is this plume of contamination migrated eastward to what is the buffer zone now and beyond the buffer zone across Indiana Street there. Um, and that the amount of environmental contamination from that activity, from that attempt to remediate it, actually caused more, a greater spread of contamination than the 57 and 69 fires. So let's discuss, discuss cleanup. I don't know why there's so many. This is the XY retriever that I mentioned. Those, that's with the earlier, earlier picture of the people in the bubble suits and then inert gas. You're going to see the next photo of this, but I just want you to get a visual of this. Uh, production was 1951 until 1989, and the reason production stopped in 89 was that the FBI and the EPA raided the site. It was the first time one federal agency had raided another federal agency, and it was based upon uh, claims that there was illegal burning of hazardous and radioactive materials at the site. There was a period that they were allowed to burn, then they had to suspend operations, and during that period, there were allegations that they were continuing to burn. So they raided the site, and the site never reopened. Cleanup was completed in, um, excuse me, started in 1995 in earnest. It was completed in 2005. There were 800 plus buildings at Rocky Flats. I live in Boulder. I think of it as sort of downtown Boulder. Imagine downtown Boulder, and that's production. And then when cleanup is, there's no more concrete left. There's no more buildings. There's, there's no infrastructure. And you're looking around to say, well, I remember that's where Boulder Creek is, and here's where Mapleton comes in, and you have some orientation. That's what Rocky Flats is. 800 buildings, a 385-acre industrial area with a buffer zone being around 5,800 acres. There were 21 metric tons of weapons-grade nuclear materials. This was a nuclear facility. 100 metric tons of plutonium residues. Um, 275,000 cubic meters of radioactive waste and 360 what were called IHISs, individual hazardous substance sites, basically areas where there was known contamination or thought to be contamination. Um, so there was, in this small, relatively small area, a lot of buildings, five of the ten most um, dangerous buildings in the DOE complex, and all of this had to come down, all of this had to be cleaned up. Clean up, and so Picture here, same angle, but halfway through cleanup here, same room. Um, cleanup took 10 years. It cost approximately $7 billion. You see these, these moon suits here. You see they have these cords going. These are actually double air respirator suits. Um, so they've got this, this air coming in, and then it's, you'll see in another picture where they're actually wearing masks. <coughs> very, very, very dangerous industrial work, and then you add on top of that the um, radioactive and hazardous component to it. Very hard work. Um, but cleanup, and this is a couple of things to really keep in mind. Cleanup ex meets or exceeds all applicable state and federal regulations. The number one concern during cleanup was plutonium. They used to, there was a button back when they sort of were about to start cleanup, and it said, it's the plutonium, stupid. I mean, that's what it was. It was the plutonium. The plutonium standard, which you're really most concerned about, is water and water leaving this site. 
the standard is 100 times greater than the federal drinking water standard for plutonium. So we have this standard which is 100 times greater than the federal standard and it has yet to be breached as water is leaving the site. And that to me is the strongest indication of the cleanup. Um, but low levels of radioactive um, um, contamination remain both on site and off site. And, and you'll see this in a little bit. Groundwater plumes are still being treated. This core production area still is, remains a surplus site because of these uh, needs to remediate the groundwater still. And that could take another 50 to 70 to 100 years. It's, a, it's different systems that they're using. A couple of just cleanup photos just to give you a sense of this. Um, these were uh, the plasma arc welders. There were actually a lot of size reduction activities working in glove boxes. So you, you've got this protective suit on, you're working in this glove box, and then you're maneuvering stuff. And very, very hard work. If uh, this was a standard industrial practice, uh, you know, say building the parkway over here, you would have, or building um, Mile High Stadium, you would have had, you know, probably five to six people, just industrial accidents killed, just in terms of the amount of hours worked, and, and not one person lost a life. Um, again, the bubble suits. You can see this guy out here isn't wearing a respirator because they're actually in the double bubble suits and then they're in a bubble tent. So really trying to control airflow in these buildings. This is uh, taking down one of the ex one of the buildings outside. You know, a lot of the buildings were able to be disposed of as um, municipal in the municipal landfills because they were free of contamination, but some were taken down as low level waste. The 903 pad, which I mentioned. This is it in 50s or 60s. This is a picture. You can see the tent around the outside there. They actually tinted different sections as they worked. They had negative air, so if there was an air leak, air would rush in. They removed the concrete slab, and then they started chasing the contamination, and in some places uh, went down four feet. And you can see you know, a worker here wearing a respirator to work inside of a tent. And then, Here's the 903 pad. This is in 2005, in August of 2005. You're looking from the southeast to the northwest. You can see the um, Wind Technology Center there. You can see mining operations there. And there's still some work going on at Rocky Flats. This uh, coconut matting here in the foreground is very important. It's uh, the way in which plutonium moves in the environment at Rocky Flats is as a particulate. It's, it's, it's insoluble, so it actually has to latch on to something. And so by working on um, these restoration activities to restore the grasses is a way to, to decrease the movement of plutonium across the site, and it's a key part of the remedy. And um, so you'll see, also the last photo I have, you can see different um, areas that are uh, uh, where the grasses have come back. And um, it's, uh, most areas are doing pretty well. Some require more work. But this is a key component to clean up. A couple before and after pictures. Uh, I think this is around 95. You can see the mining activity out here. We'll talk about that. Or I'll show you another photo later of that. It was a high production. This was the security area here. This is where all the buildings were. This is where the fires were. The 903 pad was this area here. Lots of business park stuff in there. Um, Trustee Sorelli, where was your office in there somewhere? Right where you just circled. Where you said Were you in 460? <laughs> no. Or you were in a trailer? I was in uh, 850. Okay, okay. So there was all these, and then there was all these trailers out here. I mean, it really was when you went out there. It was, it was a little city. And then from similar angle, this is uh, 2005. So you can see how everything's gone, and it's really working on restoration activities there. And then this one, this one is, is you'll see the next one is Photoshopped, but it gives you a good sense. So this is, oops, from there, it doesn't really look like that, but you get a sense sort of, you know, of how it, what it would look like once all of the grasses have grown back. I don't know why this is. I've got these slides from someone, and I guess as I imported into the presentation, they had the timing on it. Um, so in 2001, the question is, what do you do with a former site like this? Congress uh, passed um, legislation to designate it as a national wildlife refuge. The Rocky Flats Coalition, of which Superior was a, um, one of the seven governments that was part of that, the coalition of the seven governments <laughs> that surround the site, 
um, realized that we had this incredible asset and the site could be redeveloped. In fact, most of the site is actually clean enough to support residential developments. Um, and that you, there was this great asset. How do we protect it? And there's a couple of different values. Keep it as federal ownership, protect it for its natural state. And as things played out, the obvious answer became to protect it as a national wildlife refuge. Um, but it's, it's um, the, the key thing, and I think this is most important, you know, because there's always the question of is it safe? And it's a question I will never answer. But I think a good way to, because, you know, I drove here, is that safe, you know? There's, uh, there's all sorts of questions that I stay away from safety. But is it protective? Extremely, extremely low levels of radiation are in most of the site that are so low that it, is, uh, that it can support residential developments. And that's something we didn't want to see. So we got it designated as a National Wildlife Refuge. And this is the Lindsay Ranch. This is the first area that should be open once Congress gets funding. This is the northwest portion of the site. And it's an old homestead there. And it's, uh, it really, I mean, it's a terrible photo, but it really is, it is that beautiful over there. And when you're in there, you actually have no idea that you're at Rocky Flats. So, um, as I promised, drinking out of a fire hose here, but just trying to try to absorb all these different things, because there's a lot to know. This is, um, this is the site boundary here. It's this dotted line. The wind technology center's up here. There's actually 137 acres here. Highway 93 is, does not abut Rocky Flats. It's over here. This is Charlie McKay's land over there that you've seen. For, you know, he's wanted to develop at various points for sale signs, all of that stuff. Uh, this is state land, land board section down here. Superior then is over here. So this is what is called the DOE retained land in Rocky Flats parlance. They call it the central, central operating unit. But DOE retained this land. And what you can see here is that this old dotted area here is the 384-acre former industrial area. And then what DOE retained were the old, the, uh, what they call the present landfill, which is an actual landfill as opposed to a dump that was capped. The original landfill, which is a dump that was capped. I mean, when I mean dump, there's no... There's no line or there's nothing. It was literally throw it over the back, you know, throw it over that ridge line there, and they eventually capped it. And these these ponds, there's pond C2, there's these B series ponds, and there's A series ponds. And we'll come back to those ponds here in a, in a few moments. So the reason DOE held on to this is, is two things. Number one, as I mentioned, is groundwater. There's still ongoing groundwater remediation but also to keep people off the remedies. You don't want people running around caps. You don't want people going and kicking groundwater wells. You don't want people you know, doing something to a, a surface water monitoring station. You're really the number one thing. It's not a risk to us if we went there, but it's actually to keep people from disturbing the remedies, disturbing the lands. And that's the principal reason, along with the groundwater treatment systems, why DOE held on to that land. So, um, This here is, I wish I got the full thing. I was trying to copy something off of the, the, this database that DOE has. It doesn't go all the way to Indiana. You see up on the legend there, it doesn't quite go to the site boundary. But what these are are um, water monitoring points. The primary responsibility for the Rocky Flat Stewardship Council, our primary role is to provide a public forum to examine issues related to the long-term maintenance of the site. And that includes, but it's certainly in no way limited to, looking at monitoring data. Quarterly, the Department of Energy comes to our board. It's a public meeting, and they brief, and they lay it all out. Um, here's what's gone on the last quarter. Here's the issues. Here's what the data says. And, and everybody can look at the same data sets. Water monitoring is one of the key things we constantly are briefed on. There's over 100 or approximately 100 water monitoring points. Most of these are groundwater. Um, the, the, the little diamonds and some are missing are the surface water, the rest are groundwater points. And so there's still extensive monitoring going on. The cleanup itself was based upon more than 1 million data points. That doesn't mean monitoring points. That means a, a point can have multiple data points. So the site's been heavily characterized. There was a lot of independent review. Uh, as the American attest to some of those discussions there. 
Um, but one thing to be aware of is that air monitoring was discontinued. Air monitoring was discontinued in around 2007. And the reason was that if you actually go look at air monitoring data, there was at the site boundary, there was in the communities, and there were sort of concentric layers of air monitoring during cleanup, some very site specific. Take down a building, you put a bunch of air monitors right there. And what was being seen was there was not this migration of contamination moving off site. In fact, all of the air monitors at the site boundary were showing really no contamination. What they were showing is a lot of particulate matter resulting from the mining activities on the west part of the refuge. Um, so that was discontinued and to the consternation of some. So looking forward, I mean, that's, that's a lot to, and I'll just toss all this out and then as many questions we have, as, as much time as you have. Um, <coughs> this is a, sort of a strange angle. You can actually sort of, you can actually see a little bit of the curvature there. These are the drainages. You have A series drainage, B series drainage. These are Walnut Creek. These come off of Rocky Flats down here and wind around Great Western Reservoir. And then you have Woman Creek C series drainage, which goes into a reservoir that was built in 1995. It was a project that my old boss, uh, Congressman Skag, spearheaded to protect Stanley Lake from uh, offsite migration during cleanup. Uh, pond management, I'll discuss in a a little bit more in a moment, but that's a big issue. Second big issue is what's called the CERCLA five-year reviews. The site, because of groundwater, remains on the CERCLA a national priorities list. And so every five years, there's a formal process that has to be followed. And that uh, next one is in 2012 and then 2017. Uh, former workers, I have no idea you know, how many former site workers live in your community, but there is a federal program that is being poorly implemented. Workers are being denied due compensation under the federal program. It's a top priority for Senator Udall and the rest of the delegation. That's a big thing that we constantly are looking at at the Stewardship Council. We have a retirees group, as I mentioned, as part of the Stewardship Council. Um, and funding for the refuge. The refuge isn't open because there is no money. And so um, that's something to, that we'll be looking, continue to look at as we move forward. One thing to point out, because you see, you know, these drainages and water moving off site, none of the water re leaving Rocky Flats, none of it, zero, is used for drinking water. We have this high plutonium drinking water standard, but none of the water is used for drinking water. Now here's a closer view of the Walnut Creek ponds. These are the A series, and these are the B series. Just want to mention two very specific issues just to give you a flavor of the types of things that we're grappling with, the types of things, there's been some press about this, the types of things that warrant the continued involvement of the Stewardship Council, you know, why Superior should still be involved, why the other governments should be involved, why the community groups should be involved. Right now these are dams and they are water restored and then when they hit a certain point the Department of Energy decides they have to release the water. There's extensive, there's, uh, there's uh, protocols for testing the water, reporting uh, those test results. Once all that is cleared, then the water is released. That information is provided, the data that is gathered from that testing is, is provided to, among others, the Stewardship Council. It's discussed at our meetings, it's provided to staff, we forward that to the board. Um, what the Department of Energy is looking to do is there are literally outlet valves on these dams, and they're looking to open them and to drop the dam level down and, and manage them in a flow-through condition to try to establish more let wetlands and try to establish more of a natural um, system flow for the drainages. The, um, the, the, the way it would work is that they would do this for the next eight to ten years, and if, if testing showed that human health and the environment was being protected, namely if um, the, uh, the standards were continuing to be met, then what DOE would propose or is proposing is that they would breach the dams and you would no longer have a dam with an open valve. You would just actually breach the dam. And you can see here, see these little white marks here? These are dams that have been breached. Basically, you breach it and then you create a rock outflow to control the flow of the stream. Um, this proposal has drawn great criticism, not because drinking water supplies are at risk, but because this is a modification, and, uh, and for many, they f many feel it's a major modification very, clean af very soon after closure. Uh, and as I said, just as a reminder, closure happened in 2006. Another point, and this is my second to last slide, 
um, to just talk about sort of the types of things we're grappling with. So that's the DOE lands that I talked about. The terminal ponds, that's the A, that's A4, the one we were just looking at, that's B5, the one we were looking at. And I didn't show you this one, but there's C2, and that's on the Woman Creek um, drainage. Right now, water for compliance is tested at these points exiting Indiana Street. So this is Indiana Street here, and that's where the water goes under to Broomfield and um, Westminster's land. And the Department of Energy wants to move those water monitoring, testing, and compliance points to the edge of their boundary. Uh, we, I could speak for a long time about that. It's not that important for the purposes of this meeting. I think for the purposes of this meeting, which is important, is to understand that there are complex issues being discussed. As a regulatory matter, where do you monitor and why? From a health standpoint, how do you manage ponds and why? From a community perception standpoint, what do you do? You know, there's this perception that there's all this nasty stuff coming off the site. And if I wasn't up to my eyeballs in this for the last 16 years, I'd have that same reaction. And so how do you communicate about that uh, is also very difficult and very important as well. So, um, and, and, and the, the other thing too is that, and, and, and you see this all in all sorts of um, issues when it comes to um, industrial type of work and cleanup work and that stuff, is that we all agree on the same thing, protection of human health and the environment, but there's different ways to accomplish that. And that's really where the debate gets always interesting and, 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 and very um, fruitful. And so the final slide, I just want to give you an overhead view. This is two years ago, but you can still see that, you know, grasses are still growing. It looks a lot better now than it did then. Um, but just, uh, and you can see the mining activities. These are within the site boundary. They were not the original site boundary. They were following the acquisition in 74 and 75. This one mine here, Lakewood Brick and Tidal, I think dates to uh, 1924. Um, and then this one is the, you know, when you're on 36 <coughs> and it's used to be Lafarge and now it's T whatever X, that's, that's that mine there. And so anyway, that's Rocky Flats, I would say in a nutshell, but I think it really is out of a fire hose. So <laughs> let me, let me pause there and see if you have any questions, comments, concerns, thoughts. Mr. Abelson, thank you so much for coming uh, this evening and thank you for all your hard work for the past 15 years. I personally have appreciated it. It's uh, very complex issue that it's great to have some of your caliber uh, helping to monitor it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, questions from the board? Jesse Skumatz. I was pointing over there, but I was waiting oh. a second. Oh, okay. Just a course. Great presentation. Fire hose or not, it was really great <laughs> to, to get the background, the historical uh, data and pictures do uh, speak louder than anything else. What's the wildlife right now? I didn't see any pictures of why. Is there wildlife? Sure. Yeah. Um, and you what do you hope it, what's the future looking like? Sure. Take yeah. advantage of this great property. If you look around the, f the federal military complex, there's some great wildlife resources. You know, Nature Conservancy has a great project down by Colorado Springs. Um, you know, Hanford, Washington, a former nuclear weapons facility, great wildlife resources. And the reason you have that is that these areas were largely off limits. Right. And so then the wildlife could thrive. Um, you have, you know, you have your deer, you have your elk, you have your birds, you have um, uh, um, prairie dogs. You have, uh, there, was even, there was a look at trying to actually reintroduce uh, one of the grouses. Um, Boulder County was talking about just north of here is Boulder City and Boulder County land. And they were looking at a grouse reintroduction project there. Um, you have a lot of different plant species, and then you also have the challenges of invasive species as well, Dalmatian toad flax, which I don't know if you have to deal with in your open space lands, but I know Boulder and Boulder County and Jefferson County have to deal with that. Um, so, and part of the reason why it became a wildlife refuge versus some other reservation was because of the um, Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Senator Allard was the um, worked very hard to get Rocky Mountain Arsenal designated as a National Wildlife Refuge. And so when it came to Rocky Flats, then Representative Udall, when he was newly representative, said, let's protect this. And over a couple year period, and it was very politically chaotic there for a while, what was settled on between Allard and Udall, and it really was a truly bipartisan effort, was that the model that worked for the arsenal would work at, at Rocky Flats. 
uh, it wasn't necessarily so much driven by wildlife considerations, but it was a model that worked that could be applied here. Thank you. Says comments. So I did work at Hanford for five years, oh. but that's a real environmental disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I I remember seeing maps where they had trenches, as you described, where things got dumped, and they'd be going one way, and a fence would be going the other way, saying, "Do not dig here," you know, yeah. just at cross purposes. But in any case, um, uh, this is a case of a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, right? Uh -huh. So I I read that book, Cadillac Desert, right? Uh -huh. And so you're talking about these dams, and I wondered how. How old are those dams? And I think one of the arguments they were making in that book for not breaching dams was not the water or whatever, but the PVCs that are embedded in the PCBs that are embedded in the dirt that's right. backed up behind dams. Right. They're not old dams, so that's not an issue? You know, it's interesting because that's one constituent that never comes up in dialogue. Um, a lot of... Th th it gets a little tricky in the dam because what you really have is you have you know, material comes in and it settles. And so what you're really concerned about is the sedimentation. Yes. And disturbing the sediments. And so the actual way that if they were to operate, breach them and, and, or even operate them in a flow through is not to remove all water, but to actually bring it to about a 10% level. Now that would fluctuate because of natural changes in, in hydrology, but bring it to about a 10% level. And then sort of the stuff that became dry the soils would be stabilized because of, um, you know, cattails and, and different rushes and sedges and you know all of the, the, the um, all of the, the wetlands habitat. But one of the things that also happened was during cleanup was sort of that question of well, what about the sediments? Because if there was all this loading into the ponds, what happens at that point? And they tested the ponds and actually two or three of them they did. And I can't remember exactly how many, but they did actually have to do sediment uh, removal because the stand, because the, the, the concentration of the contamination in there was that they, they, they modeled the ponds that if they ever became, instead of sediments underwater, if they ever became surface soils, would they have to be remediated? And because of that, they said, okay, this pond, this pond, and this pond, we have to, they have to go ahead and remediate those soils. Um, and, you know, different constituents, but the primary ones were the primary one, I should say, really was um, was um, uh, plutonium, and then there was also uranium was a big concern as well. But I think this had to do with stuff that was completely legal in the 60s or the yeah. whatever, and PCBs are just yeah. in that strata. Sure, and, sure. And, and beyond for a while. So. Yeah. And there's also, you know, another constituent that was, uh, it really led to the, to sort of changing, really adding the ponds as they have them now, was, um, um, was tritium. Was uh, uh, there was a release in 1973 that came out of the wastewater plants down the B series ponds and ended up in Great Western, Western Reservoir. Mm -hmm. So, on PCBs specifically, no clue. Um, there is questions about you know ultimately dam safety over a long period of time, except for one of the dams they think you know sooner than later needs to have some work done on it. Just more questions from the board. Public questions or comments? <laughs> Any? Okay. Well, once again, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thank, thank you. you. Great <laughs> All right. That brings us to item number six: uh, consent agenda, and on the consent agenda is acceptance of the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting, approval of liquor license renewal for Chuck E. T.'s restaurant, preliminary reading of an ordinance adopting the fiscal year 2011 operating capital improvement. Um, Budgets and adoption of a resolution supporting Boulder County ballot issue regarding open space. Um, we'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Trustee Gregor is second by Jesse Schoolmats for the discussion. I'm checking, I don't think that we are spending any money. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. This brings us to uh, what was consideration of a call up for the approval of the final flat site plan for clear wireless. Um, and so I'll pose this to the attorney. So I have some questions, uh, and I assume that those questions require that this would come back at a different date for yes. review. Is that yes. correct? Yes, and the procedure is that if one board member requests that it be called up, it's called up, and then if it, it can be that sure. call up can be overturned by a two thirds majority of the remainder of the board. Correct. Okay. 
so Trustee Williams? Um, I was just curious uh, in the procedure of how this was written up, um, how D says consideration of a call up and E says adoption of a resolution approving. Um, curious how that how that works or sure. why that e works that way. Um, e is, is a lease agreement because we actually own the property on which this would be located if you approved it. So we would have to have a lease agreement. Okay. So they're two separate items. And agreements, the way that we've always done them here, agreements are approved by resolution. Right. So why did you write it as consideration of a call-up? Because the, plan, the Planning Commission took action on yes. it. And if we did nothing, that would be done. Approved. Correct. Right. Okay. If you if the board decided not to call up the matter, then it would be final. The approval of the planning commission would be final approval. Then you could proceed on to item E and approve the lease agreement. I see. So in other words, it wouldn't have come to the board. Exactly. Okay. And this is part of our discussion of Chapter 16. Correct. So yeah, we're getting rid of this very confusing process. And Mayor, are you going to ask your questions now or? Uh. Well, you know, I think that. Technically, I think I need to do yeah. it at the next meeting. So we need to. The reason is because under your quasi-judicial rules of procedure, we have to give the applicant notice and an opportunity to be heard in a public hearing before we can really move beyond whether or not to call it up. So, again, this is why we've gotten rid of the call up in the new land development code. Okay, so this would come back at the next regularly scheduled meeting, correct? Well, we need a we need to do a notice, we, so it needs to be. We're Going to try to get it on the 25th. Yeah. Okay. Yep. The 20th. Pennington. Um, Matt, um, if I'm correct, Matt, uh, 22 yeah. notices went out. Um, uh, I don't. Something yeah, like that. It, it's a small, that. small number because of the position of the uh, tower within Community Park and the few number of homes that are in 500 feet proximity to where the tower would go in. And at one point, we had actually talked about um, putting this out over the e-blast just as a, a courtesy so that we had maximum notice to residents um, who might be interested. Is that something we as a board are interested in, or are we OK with 22 notices going out? How many went out? I think it's 22. That was one of my questions. I saw 500 feet, and I didn't know what that meant. So, uh, you know, we need to make sure that we do everything uniformly for every exactly. project. So um, I don't know if we've Fair. finalized how that's going to occur. My recommendation is, as usual, if we are going to do this, we adopt a policy that, that right. does this for all applications. We're, in the, um, one. we're in the process of adopting, a, hopefully, a, a broader notification policy in Chapter 16. But this is one of those that probably will be done before 16 is approved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. And, yeah. I mean, we sent out the notices. We'll have to send out the notices again because <clears throat> we're having another public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and we had one resident come in and look at the plans and didn't provide any comments. Mm -hmm. um, and we had no public present at the planning commission meeting, just mm -hmm. for reference. I'd, I'd be in favor of taking whatever we're supposing we're proposing for Chapter 16 and applying it to this. I think that would be an appropriate thing. What would the attorney say? <laughs> <laughs> we're right in the middle of this application. We're stuck with the land of Alma code that we have right now. Unfortunately, we can't now force the applicant to go through the procedure that we have in the new land of Alma code. Just for notification? Right. I mean, we're, we're smack dab in the middle of this application, so... I don't believe we can t we can go back and add new notification procedures to this application. Oh, so they do the notification. We don't? Well, we do the notification, but... They provide the labels to yes. us. Right. And then we send the letter out to the residents. Exactly. But if it's just an e-blast, we can do that, couldn't we? That they're Again, saying I'm going to recommend against it, because unless you give this much attention to every single application, you're subjecting yourselves to legal challenge for giving this application more attention. <coughs> so, but and it's the board's. We put the agendas on the website. We put, you know, we put them out on uh, <coughs> Channel Eight and the mm -hmm. CAC and okay. town listserv and. Um, it went on the CAC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this is going to be asked 
and answered Kendra, but if we simply red stamp those 22 envelopes, public hearing notice enclosed, so that people don't throw it out in the uh, spam mail or whatever, is that fine? Or That's is fine. I don't know okay. issue doing that. If, I mean, if our point is to make people open the notice that we're spending the money to send, I don't think that's fine. Okay. Or how about if we said that and then and tell your neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'd like to flag those if we could. That'd be great. And I assume that the sign is still up at the location uh, for the public hearing, right? The the only issue I have is that the the our code requires 15 days notice, so we we can't do it at the next meeting. I don't know how we could. It's today's the 11th, and our next meeting is the 25th. And this is another thing we're getting rid of, but <clears throat> the 15 days makes it awkward between meetings because there are only ever 14 days between. Well, mm. not ever unless there's an. Sometimes it could be a third week. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, once again, uh, it, hopefully the whole process will be coming to an end and we won't have to deal with this in the future. Right. So, so I would suggest if we're calling it up that it not be on the 25th and that it instead be on the 8th. 8th? 8th. And a lease agreement also at that same time? Yes. We'll take a look and get it on the agenda. So. Okay. They need to, but they need to call it up. <clears throat> Do you need a date certain? Yes. Okay, so the, sec the first regularly scheduled meeting in November, unless there's some reason why we can't do that. That sound fair? Do we need to vote on that, or are you? Well, there's a, for the record, we had one, one board member who wanted to call up. Is there any motion to overrule that call up? That's all Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, that brings us to item number eight. Adoption of a resolu of resolutions urging voters uh, to vote no on certain uh, ballot questions. And Mr. Magley, thank you. Um, there are three upcoming ballot measures. Um, one is um, uh, the Proposition 101, Amendment 60 and 61. Um, each of these have uh, there's a separate resolution. Um, that takes the position of opposing each of the measures for the board's consideration. We listed, we, we gave you three separate resolutions so they could be voted on individually. Staff is recommending uh, approving the resolutions based on the uh, significant financial impact these measures could have on the town financially uh, if they are approved. Okay. So just for the record, if I could just ask one question uh, or a couple of questions of the interim manager so we try not to take uh, positions on on ballot questions unless they affect the town so could you give a synopsis of why each individual one might have <coughs> implication for town operations sure uh, proposition 101 reduces uh, um, various taxes and cuts fees uh, for example the vehicle specific ownership taxes registration fees it reduces um, the state income tax would be reduced from 4.63% to 3.5% over a period of years. Uh, it eliminates local charges and tele telecommunication charges. Uh, Amendment 60 <coughs> limits property taxes um, and taxes enterprise operations like our District 1, um, which uh, would cause a, a significant increase in potentially um, our water fees to residents. Um, it uh, and then uh, Amendment 61 limits our uh, the town's ability to um, issue debt and requires um, uh, a voter approval on any type of debt and borrowing. It uh, puts limitations on bonds, lease purchases, uh, certificate of participations. Um, all these total, if all three measures would pass, um, our staff estimates that we could lose over a million dollars a year in revenue or increased expenses to the town, which equates to just under 12% of our general fund budget. Um, and equate, uh, an example that we included was <coughs> our law enforcement budget is 1.1% million dollars and um, if we have 
lost revenue or additional expenses totaling one million, you can see the significant impact that we have to the town and our operations. Okay, thanks. Questions from the board? Or comment? Public questions or comments regarding these? Seeing none, any board action? Trustee Squimax? I'd like to make a I'd like to make a motion. Town Superior Resolution Number R-57, Series 2010, a resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town Superior urging registered voters to vote no on November 2nd, 2010, on Amendment 60. Motion by Trustee Scumatz. Is there a second? Trustee Cirelli. Further discussion? All in favor? So, Hanson, Cirelli, Scumatz, Muckle, Williams, Pennington, opposed? I'm abstaining Okay. Uh, just for the record, so abstention, I think, is a is an affirmative vote well, unless there's a unless there's a reason why you can't vote right. for it. So you'd have to vote no if you want to actually vote no. I don't want to vote no or yes. <laughs> okay, okay, that's, that's fine. fine. Yep. Trustee Skomats. Mm -hmm. I move res Town of Superior Resolution Number R-158. Series 2010, a resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior urging registered voters to vote no on November 2nd, 2010, on Amendment 61. Motion by Trustee Scomas. Is there a second, Trustee Cirelli? Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Hanson, Cirelli, Scomas, Muckle, Williams, Pennington, and abstaining is Gregoros. Okay. Okay. Williams. I'd like to make a motion. Um, on Town of Superior Resolution Number R-59, Series 2010, a resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior urging registered voters to vote no on November 2nd, 2010, on Proposition 101. Motion by Trustee Williams. Is there a second? Trustee Cirelli, further discussion? All in favor? Hanson Cirelli, School Mats, Muckle, Williams, Pennington, and abstaining as Gerberus. Thank you very much. That brings us to item number nine, executive session to hold a conference with the town's attorney to receive legal advice on specific legal questions. Pursuant to CRS 24-6-402-4-B and personnel matters pursuant to CRS 24-6-402-4-F on the town manager separation agreement. Is there a motion to go into executive session? Trustee Skumatz, is there a second? Trustee Cirelli, all in favor? It's unanimous for an executive session. Thank you. George, George. We're there in executive.